So you see that the prophets were empowered by God's word and not theirs. Because it is the word of God that is powerful and sharper than two, any two-edged sword. It is the word of God that delivers us. It is the word of God that causes us to be born again. It is the word of God that is sovereign. It is the word of God that is the source of our faith. Job said, I put your word above my necessary food. It is the word of God that guides us. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. This is Elder Fitz. Welcome to the LFCC Minister's Corner. Hey, want to stop to say welcome to all of our latest subscribers. Thank you so much for taking the time to hit that subscribe button. And if you want to be notified every time new content is uploaded, then please enable the notifications bell as well. Well, in today's video, I'm playing a sermon in its entirety that I preached at my church a few weeks ago. Sermon is called, This Is As Good As It Gets. And I have a subtitle as well, which is called, the locusts are coming. You want to buckle up for this one. And I do believe this sermon is a warning to the church, to the body of Christ. Well, without further ado, here's my sermon. This is as good as it gets. For today's sermon is, this is as good as it gets. This is as good as it gets. And I have a subtitle. Uh, it's not on the screen. And I intentionally didn't send it to the media team because it's one of those things you don't see coming. If you aren't careful, it's, it's, it's something that happens in our lives and our society that can take us by surprise. So help me preach this to your neighbor and tell them the locusts are coming. See, the locusts are coming. The locusts are coming. I'm going to fix it all up by the time we leave here today. Amen? The locusts are coming. So today we're going to spend a lot of time in the book of Joel. And I want to start off with Joel chapter 2, verse 11. And I'll be reading from the ESV translation. This is going to be sort of our anchor for today. And it reads, the Lord utters his voice before his army. For his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great. Remember that phrase, day of the Lord. And very awesome, who can endure it? Yet, even now. Yet, even now. I say it, yet, even now, declares the Lord. Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him? a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Now, the prophets are broken up into two categories. You have your major prophets and you have your minor prophets. Now, it doesn't have anything to do with the importance. God doesn't prefer one prophet over another. It's the volume of their writings. Isaiah, for example, 66 chapters, that's a lot. Joel only has three. So you have the volume, the differences in length of the books is why one is called a major prophet and one is called a minor prophet. And I used to love watching boxing growing up. I watched the boxing all the time. And uh, who remembers uh, a fighter named Larry Holmes? Larry Holmes had a devastating jab. I mean, it was like a rock and a steel just come and he was big and he could, you know, he was a defensive fighter and he would wear you down and probably about the sixth or seventh, eighth round or whatever it is. Uh, Larry Holmes can knock you out. So Larry Holmes is our major prophet, right? He, he can set you up. Now, Mike Tyson, on the other hand, that brother tried to knock your head off in the first 90 seconds. There ain't no setup. There ain't no jab. He ain't worried about the body. He's trying to knock your head off. He gets right to the point. Mike Tyson is your minor prophet. Sugar Ray Leonard, a magician in the ring, uh, just a tactician. I mean, just quick. He was hard to hit. He would pop you and then come back and then he would knock you out in the later round. But marvelous Marvin Hagler was a straight street brawler. He didn't have no plan but to knock you out. That was his only plan. He went straight to the point. Marvin Hagler is your minor prophet. And so your minor prophets don't spend a lot of time with certain details, right? They, they kind of get to the, the heart and meat of the message. But we have a clue about this book based on what Joel's name means, because his name means Yahweh is God. And so he sets the stage on this book. Yahweh is God. 
only Yahweh is God. Buddha's not God. Confucius is not God. Money is not God. Yahweh is God. He is the sovereign Lord. He is the one from the beginning to the end. He is the one that is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-seeing. Yahweh is God. Most scholars date this book after Israel comes back from Babylonian exile. So for those of you who are familiar with Old Testament history, Israel is split into two kingdoms. You got the northern kingdom, you got the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom, because of their idolatry, sin, and wickedness, they go into captivity by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom, because of their idolatry, wickedness, and disobedience, they are taken captive by the Babylonians. The Babylonians are overtaken by the Persians, and then the Persians allow the, the remnant of Israel to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. So they've come back, and this is when this particular book is dated, after they have come back. And your prophets are broken up into various seasons, right? You got your, your pre-monarchy prophet, your pre-classical, and you have your classical prophets, which is like Joel, Jeremiah, Isaiah. And when your classical prophets come on the scene, things are not going well. Because it's your classical prophets that begin to call out sins of the nation of Israel. They talk about society. They're the ones who send forth rebuke from God. They're the ones who begin to warn them of captivity and destruction. They warn them about their sin. They warn them about their idolatry. And they tell them God is not pleased and that this is, X, y, this is going to happen if you don't get it together. Now, your prophets are talking to the church, Israel. There's also restoration. So in the mix of all of the issues the prophets bring up, there's always that time of restoration and repentance as well. And we get a good example of this in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1.9 gives the purpose and message for his calling. And it reads, then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set your, this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. So you see that the prophets were empowered by God's word and not theirs. Because it is the word of God that is powerful and sharper than two, any two-edged sword. It is the word of God that delivers us. It is the word of God that causes us to be born again. It is the word of God that is sovereign. It is the word of God that is the source of our faith. Job said, I put your word above my necessary food. It is the word of God that guides us. Hey, never, it is the word of God. If you want to have anything happen in your life, if you want to be blessed, it is through the word of God. And so we have to put the word of God in our hearts because it is the word of God that the prophets begin to speak that plucks and bring things down. Because when, the, when Jeremiah receives the word that he is going to pluck up and to bring down, that is him calling out sin. Him calling out all of the ills and all of the issues of Israel because they had gotten rooted and grounded in disobedience. What are you rooted in? Because whatever roots you plant, that is what's going to come up. The Bible even warns us about having a root of bitterness. Do you have a root of anger? Is lust the thing you're rooted in? Because you have to be careful. Joel is talking to Israel, to the church, not sinners. We know sinners are rooted in wickedness. This is a word to the house about what are you rooted in? Because anything that is not of God will be plucked up. It will be uprooted and it will be torn down. And when he talks about things like being destroyed and overthrown, those are God's judgment. So Joel, along with the other prophets, these are the kinds of messages that they are bringing forth. Because we have to build on the Lord. It is imperative that we build in Christ. That's the only thing that's going to last. Only what you do for Christ is going to last. And in this season of everything in our world being uprooted, everything being tossed upside down, it is imperative that the body of Christ be rooted in the word of God. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So as believers, we have a mandate to be rooted and grounded in Christ the Lord, because that is how we are built up. That's where we receive our strength. And I love and I chuckle at all the millennials and Gen Zers just out there hustling. I mean, they are out there just getting it. Just hustling. They got three and four jobs. They done built an app. They done, they doing all this stuff and ain't going nowhere. 
And in college, we would say, bro, you're just spinning your wheels. You're doing all this effort with no progress. You mean you're doing all of this work and you still don't own your own home? You're doing all this work and you still don't have a retirement built? You got no life insurance? You got 10 jobs? They are doing all of this work. And they're not special. We did it. Anybody in their 20s and 30s did all that running around. You tried every scheme. You had every flyer. You built your little website. And all of that just didn't turn out to anything. Because we are built on the word of God. So if what you're doing isn't quite working, if you're feeling that angst and that frustration because, Lord, I, I'm paying my tithes and I'm doing this. I've come to church and I'm, I launched this business and I did this and this failed and things changed. What do you do when it doesn't work? Well, let's take a look at Psalm chapter 1. Let's see what the psalmist has to say. He says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. So the blessed person loves God's word. The blessed person meditates on God's word. And for that person, verse 3, he is like a tree planted by the streams of waters. And the last time I checked, a tree doesn't plant itself. So when you spend time in God's word, he will plant you next to the streams. He will plant you by the streams of water that yield its fruit in a season and its leaf does not wither. Spending time in God's word will cause the blessing to follow you. It'll cause the blessings to overtake you. I don't can tell you how many times it wasn't because of my effort. It wasn't because I was a networking. It wasn't because my resume looked so well. It wasn't because I had a business plan. It's because I spent time in God's word and prayer, and he planted me right next. I mean, just ridiculous, stupid things that happened that I didn't even pray for. As a matter of fact, I didn't even have the words to pray for it. God just did it. So if you spend time in God's word, he has a way of taking you and planting you next to the streams of waters so you will be fruitful in season and your leaf doesn't wither, meaning God will preserve you. He'll preserve you through the pandemic. He'll preserve you through the hurricane. He'll preserve you through being laid off. He'll preserve you through the sickness. Let me tell you, this is a testimony. This is just me and my house. But during recessions, I've always done better. It's been through recessions and downfalls when my salary skyrocketed. I'm talking salary, bonuses, stock options, just all, I mean, people being laid off all around me. And here I am just getting doing better and better because in those dry seasons, God will still preserve you. He'll preserve you in the desert. He'll preserve you during those times of stress and trials and tribulation if you love his word. If you spend time in God's word, he'll cause you to prosper. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff that the wind drives away because they have no root. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. It is spent time in the word of God that will unlock your gifts. Pastor um, Bago preached that last week about those gifts being dormant and being stirred. It's the word of God that will unlock your dreams and your vision. It's the word of God that will cause you to be prosperous. It's the word of God that will begin to bubble up and it will begin to unlock the gifts of God that are planted on the inside of you. I used to tell people all the time whenever I did a lot of street ministry, and I would say, Oftentimes, your destiny is unlocked by the word of God. God put something wonderful inside you. You are gifted. You are talented. You are blessed. But it takes the word of God is the key that unlocks that blessing that's going to manifest in your life. Amen? So just spend time in the word of God. Israel found themselves rooted and grounded in all types of immorality, all types of injustice, pride, arrogance, selfishness, and all of that brought judgment. It brought judgment to the nation of Israel. Now, in Joel chapter 1, he starts off by talking about these locusts. There is a locust infestation that has hit the nation of Israel. Well, I'm hoping you're enjoying the message so far. I wanted to break in real quick. I have a book recommendation for you. I just got through reading a book called Preaching the Whole Council of God design and deliver gospel centric sermons by Julius Kim. And what I really found fascinating about this book is that it goes into the neuroscience of preaching and it gives the preacher, the teacher, the tools to be more effective so that your audience 
can really be with you and be engaged and to be paying attention and to receive what the word of the Lord is on that particular day. It is well worth the read. So I highly encourage you to take a look up this book and add it to your library. I'll have a link down in the description down below. It is an Amazon affiliate link, so I'll certainly appreciate you taking the time to check it out. Well, let's get back to the message because the locusts are coming. Now, when I was 14 years old, uh, we went from Berlin, Germany, to a little town called Canyon, Texas. It was about 17 miles south of Amarillo, up in the Panhandle. Now, when we first got to Canyon, and I used to, I used to love watching Westerns. I used to watch all the Westerns growing up. And you know how in the West End you see that tumbleweed kind of rolling down the street? They got tumbleweeds in Canyon, Texas. I'm like, what in the world is this place? Are we in the Twilight Zone? Across the street, you have prairie dogs. They come up, you know, little prairie dogs. They come to the little ring. We have prairie dogs. I said, Lord, I said, is Marshall, is Matt Dillon about to walk down the street? Is Clint Eastwood about to ride down in a pale rider? The good, the bad. That's what it looked like. It looked like an old Western scene. So I had to go cut the grass one day. So I cut the grass in the front. Everything's cool. And I go to the backyard to cut the grass. And that backyard is filled with grasshoppers. I mean, I'm mowing the grass like, pew, 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 pew. I mean, it's like a thousand grasshoppers just scattered. I'm like, whoa, man. And so here I am, trying to be a good, you know, Christian boy. Grasshoppers lives matter. <laughs> I'm out there saying, scoop, scoop, grasshopper. Get, get, get out the way, grasshopper. Let me, you know, I clear a path out. I'd mow the lawn. Then I got to do it again. I'm clearing the grasshoppers out. What, took, what should have taken about 20 minutes, taken about an hour to cut this lawn, the backyard? The next time I cut the grass, I'm running over grasshoppers on purpose. I'm killing everything crawling in this grass. I'm just mowing them down. So be on the lookout for my Netflix special, Elder Fitz, the grasshopper killer. I just went, it was, and it was so, so irritating. Just the whole backyard just infested with grasshoppers. It's so bad in the book of Joel. Joel says to the elders of Israel and to the people, he says, tell your children and your children's children about this locust infestation. He says, go and warn them and tell them that if you do what we did, this is what you can expect. The locusts are coming. And so it got me to thinking, do we warn our children anymore these days? I remember growing up, we got warned about everything. I mean, you went to hell for everything. If you shoot chewing gum in church, you're going to hell, boy. You're going to hell. I mean, they were all in our face about sin. You better not do this. You better not do that. You better not go there. You better not say this. No, don't sit to that girl. You go sit over there, and you go sit over there. They warned us about the ills of life. Do we warn our children anymore these days? Because they, they are really, really getting out there where there's almost nothing that they won't do, nothing they won't get involved in, because we have stopped warning our children. We have stopped reading the Bible to them, preaching the gospel to them, telling them about Christ. So for all of you parents who are teaching your children about the Lord and you're warning them about life and you're teaching them about how what salvation means, you're teaching them about what repentance and sin means, then I speak a word of blessing over your house in the name of Jesus. For every parent that is raising their children in the admonition of the Lord, I pray that the Holy Ghost fulfills your house and blesses your children, that they will be able to go to any college they want to, debt free, that they will have businesses and all kinds of wisdom and all kinds of ideas. I pray the parents will have every resource that will make every opportunity available for your children. I pray the blood over your house. I pray the Holy Ghost just fills your house with wisdom, with dreams, and with visions. Hallelujah. Warn your children because the locusts are coming. We have to prepare them. And that was Joel was telling them, tell your children, your grandchildren about this unprecedented event. So let's read a little bit about these locusts. Joel chapter 1 verse 4 says, what the cutting locusts left, the swarming locusts eaten, have eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping locust left and destroyed the locust has eaten, as with the rumbling and the chariots, they leap on top of the mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire, devouring the stubble like a powerful army drawn up for battle. I don't think these are different types of locusts. I think Joel is making the point here about the extreme nature. They just literally were wiping out everything. Verse 6 says, for a nation, so notice how he calls them, a nation has come up against my land. Powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth and it has, and has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has ripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. 
So they just devoured everything. Now, the grasshoppers that I dealt with when I was growing up were just really a minor irritation. But for Israel, this was their entire society. This was their economy. They were an agricultural society. So if there is a locust invasion, your economy is affected. Now your nutrition and your health is affected. Now we're going to have sickness and disease. Now you can't sell your crops to earn any money. So now you're talking about poverty and all sorts of things happening. And so as a matter of fact, in verse 12, it says, the vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple. All the trees of the field are dried up and gladness dries up from the children of man. It's hard to be joyful when you're hungry. It's hard to be joyful when you don't know where your next meal is coming from. It's hard to be joyful when you can't sell your crops. So they are not only devastated financially, now you've probably got anxiety, you've got depression, all kinds of concern, the poor, everybody is affected by this infestation. And this is the church. These are God's people Joel is talking to because of their disobedience and idolatry and a sinful life. So it had a major impact. Now, this is not the first time we've seen locusts. We saw them back in Exodus when Israel was captive to Egypt. God sent locusts as part of the eighth plague so that Pharaoh would release God's people. And so we see God using this as a way of judgment. Now, that was really clear. We know why God sent the locusts in the book of Exodus is because he wanted God, uh, Israel or Egypt to release his people. But Joel doesn't really say. He doesn't say what led up to this locust invasion. And that's because he was writing this to his original audience. And they would have known what was going on because they were there. And plus, the Old Testament prophets, all they did was preach out of the law of Moses. They preached out of the Pentateuch. So let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. This is the blessings and cursings chapter. Here's what Moses told Israel if you disobey God. In verse 38, he says that you shall carry much seed into the field and shall gather in little, for the locust shall consume it. So locusts in this context was a curse because of their disobedience. It was sent as a warning by God because they had gotten rooted and grounded in idolatry, sexual immorality, hatred, envy, strife, injustices. And so God begins to send this judgment on the nation of Israel. And God doesn't send this kind of judgment because he's just trying to be mean or just trying to flex. He's expecting a particular type of response. And we see that response documented in Job 13 through 15, where he says, Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land of the house uh, to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. What God is looking for is repentance. When he sends judgment, when he sends correction, God is saying in his mercy, repent and return to the Lord. Joel's not talking to sinners. He's talking to the nation of Israel. He is speaking to the church. And so this is a word for us today. And when they fasted in the Old Testament, it was a fasting of mourning. It was a fasting of repentance. It was a fasting of seeking God's help. It was a fasting of forgiveness. So this tells you about the seriousness of this event, where Joel is saying the whole nation needs to go into this moment of repentance. And then he mentions something called the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord is not a specific day. It's any time the Lord shows up and, be, and begins to bring judgment. There are several days of the Lord. When God you know, sent the curse on Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, day of the Lord. When God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, day of the Lord. When God sent a flood in Noah's day and wiped out the whole planet except for Noah's family, day of the Lord. And this, what we see in Joel, is another day of the Lord, but it's not the day of the Lord. Because he says the day of the Lord is near. So this is not the big one. Like Fred Samuel would say, this is not the big one. This is but a microcosm. This is but a shadow and a type of what is eventually to come. And so Joel is saying, as bad as it is right now, this is as good as it gets. If you're going to repent and seek the Lord, you better do it right now. 
because the locusts are coming. And so he's really impressing upon them during this day of the Lord type event where there is judgment coming to get their lives right. Now, here's what's interesting about the day of the Lord. Because when God sends judgment, it doesn't affect everybody the same way. If we look at Egypt, for example, the judgments that God sent through these plagues was a judgment against Egypt, but it was deliverance for Israel. So the day of the Lord has this dynamic feel to it where it's judgment for some, but it brings deliverance and salvation for others. So the question is, when the judgment comes, what side will you fall on? Based on what you're rooted in. If you're rooted in Christ, God will cover you through the pestilence. If you're not, you'll be wasted away. You'll be plucked up, you'll be brought down, and whatever you built will be destroyed. And so this is what Joel is really trying to convey to them. And when we talk about repentance, it's not just to being sorry that it happened or just hoping God will make it go away. Pharaoh repented, but his repentance did not lead to salvation. He just wanted to issue to stop. He just wanted the plagues to stop. So when we talk about repentance, and Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians, he says it is a repentance that produces salvation. So God is expecting a repentance that will lead us to salvation. And I want to toss this idea out to you. I'm not saying this is the case. I'm not making any prophetic proclamation whatsoever, but could it be the pandemic was a day of the Lord? Because everything in our society was adversely affected. And God told Pharaoh, he says, how long before you humble yourself before me? We know American pride is strong. Nobody in here thought that pandemic was going to hit this nation like it did. No, we too rich. No, we're too intelligent. We're too smart. No, we are too technologically advanced. We got the best scientists in the world right here. And what happened? America had the highest rates of death because of the pandemic, had the highest rates of uh, infestation and infection. Our poor was adversely affected. Our health system was on the brink of collapse. Our government was on the brink of collapse. Could it be that all of this was a day of the Lord. Because these locusts were unstoppable. When that virus hit, my, my, my. Because any and everything is at God's disposal. There is nothing hidden from God. He will do whatever he needs to do to get our attention. Saved and the unsaved were affected. So what will our response be? Now, when the pandemic hit, man, everybody was praying. I mean, they were praying on YouTube. They were praying on Facebook, Instagram. You had TikTok prayers going down. They were praying on the street. They were praying in the grocery store. God wants repentance in this season. So as a nation, repentance is what God calls for when there is this day of the Lord. Because if we don't, something worse is coming. If we don't change our heart and return to the Lord, the locusts are coming. In Joel chapter 2, he begins to go into this visionary kind of explanation. He also begins to say that to Israel, look, as bad as these locusts are, and it is horrible, this ain't the worst thing that can happen. This is as good as it gets. The time to return to the Lord is now. Now, we know that generally speaking about people who don't believe. Joel's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to the church. Because people are walking away from church and from the faith with nowhere to go. You're going to leave the church now? We've seen and we all witnessed this day of the Lord. Oh, now you're going to walk away from the Lord? Because if you walk away now, something worse is coming. And so he begins to tell them, look, this is not the worst that can happen. If you're going to repent, repent now. If you're going to get saved, get saved now. If you're going to get in your word, get in your word now. If you're going to get rooted in Christ, root it now. If you're going to warn your children, warn them now because the locusts are coming. And so this is a sign of warning. And it's God's mercy. And it's in his grace because things could be so much worse. And he starts talking about things like the moon being darkened, the stars falling out and losing their shine. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm not going to read it, so I'm going to skip Matthew 24. But Matthew 4 24 talks about Jesus talking about the tribulation period and how when Jesus comes back, there's going to be, uh, he's going to come back in the clouds of glory. There's going to be this trumpet sound. The angels are going to go and gather his people together. And there's going to be uh, all sorts of cosmic calamities that are happening. And so Jesus himself makes it clear that a day of the Lord is coming and that we have to get prepared now. Because there's going to become a time at the end where we won't have time to call on the Lord. 
If you're going to do it, like the old folks said, do it while the blood is running warm in your vein. While you're on this side of the grave, now is the time to call out to the Lord. Because there's going to come a time when judgment hits, and we're not going to be able to make that choice. And so he's calling for the church to repent and to turn back to the Lord. And I think that it was really sort of apropos that today is Communion Sunday. Because Communion Sunday is about reflecting on our lives and about confessing those sins and those things that we know aren't right. And so as we sit and as we think through this text, and God has given us his word as an example of what we need to do. In this season, let us seek our hearts and let us begin to turn back to the Lord. Because Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be found which means there's going to come a time you won't find him because this is as good as it gets. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord for that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God in his grace and in his mercy sends judgment so that we can get it right, so that we can repent so that we can return to the Lord. Because the next locusts that are coming are going to be horrific. And we get a snapshot of what the locusts are in the book of Revelations. So in Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star falling from heaven to earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft arose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened. How does air get darkened? And with smoke from the shaft, then from the smoke came locusts on the earth. And they were given power like the power of scorpions on the earth. And they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. Look at the Look at the twist. Locust in Joel's day was about destroying the earth, the vegetation. The locust in John the Revelator speaking about is about people being attacked. Those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Those who are lost. Those who hadn't repented. Those who hadn't given their lives to Christ. Those who do not belong to God. Verse 5, they were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. For their torment was like the torment of a scorpion with it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will free from them. It's going to be so bad, you're going to want to commit suicide and can't. Because God is going to ensure you're going to feel all of this. This is as good as it's going to get. Because it's going to be so much worse in the future. And then verse 7 says, In appearance, the locusts are like horses prepared for battle. On their heads are like crowns of gold. Their faces are like human faces. What in the world do these things look like? Hair like women's hair. They got teeth like lions. They got breastplates of iron. Their wings make noise like many chariots. Their tails sting like scorpions. But their power, her people for five months, is in their tails. They have a king over them from the angel of the bottomless pit. His name is the Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek it's called Apollyon. That word Abaddon means destroyer. There's a demonic, there's a demon who is the destroyer, who's going to lead this horde of locusts. Now, whether this is literal or whether this is figurative, we don't get caught up on the symbols. The point is, calamity and devastation is coming. And so, Joel is not speaking to sinners. We know sinners need to get right. He's speaking to the church. And so the Lord is saying that in this day, and in this hour, he wants his body to get right. He wants those who have confessed him as Lord and Savior to get it together. And I know this is a very sobering sermon, and it is by design, because I want us to think through what we're doing with our lives, because if you're waiting for things to change to come to the Lord, it ain't coming. Today is as good as it gets. If you're going to get rooted and planted in God, tomorrow is not the time to do it. It's today, because today, right now, and in this hour, it is as good as it's going to get, because if you don't take advantage of your time right now, the locusts are coming. So for anybody who has drifted away from the Lord, we're going to take some time to make sure that we begin to pray and to seek the Lord to come back to him, to recommit our lives, to rededicate our lives. And for those who don't know the Lord, now's your time to get up under the umbrella and under the covering of Jesus Christ because this world is going crazy. 
It's one thing after the next, after the next, after the next. And if you're thinking all that stuff is going to go away and life is going to improve, and it may for a short time, but don't be improved when a cool wind blows by because the locusts are going to be in that wind. Devastation is coming. And so if you want to rededicate your life today, then you're going to stand to your feet and we're going to pray and we're going to rededicate and recommit our lives to him. We're going to make sure that we are rooted and grounded in the Lord. And if you want to give your life to Christ and you want to get saved and stand to your feet and we prepare to say, pray this prayer and lead you in a prayer of rededication, a prayer of salvation. And if you're watching online and if that's you, then get your heart and get your mind prepared because the locusts are coming. This is a word of warning. But in the warning, there is deliverance. In the warning, there is grace and that there is mercy. Thank God you had the opportunity to hear it because God is speaking a word to say, hey, I'm giving you a chance to get your life right. Hallelujah. So if that's you, we're going to pray this prayer. You can repeat after me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I confess I was born a sinner in need of a Savior. Lord, forgive me for turning my back on you. Forgive me from walking away from you. But today, I recommit, I rededicate my life to you, my service to you. Lord, you are my Lord, you are my God, and you are my Savior. Lord, thank you for saving me. And I repent of all of my sins. And I thank you for shedding your blood on the cross for me. You took on my judgment so I don't have to. And I commit my life to you forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. And I feel led to pray a prayer over the body of Christ. Speak a blessing over you. Speak a covering over you. Because these are trying times. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak a word of blessing over your people, over everybody who has confessed you as Lord and Savior, over everybody who is rooted and grounded in your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just begin to send reminders for us to pray and to seek your face on a daily basis. Holy Spirit, provoke us to get deep into your word so that we can be planted by rivers of waters, so that we can be blessed in everything that our hands touch. And Lord, I pray right now that you begin to cover your body. You begin to protect us and keep us covered, Lord God, from the storms of life. From every pestilence, Lord God, cover us. From the locusts that are covering, cover us, Lord God. Cover our children, our homes, Lord God, and our businesses. And Lord, we just commit our lives to you. And we thank you. And we give you glory. And we give you honor. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. If there's anybody who is rooted and grounded in the Lord, give your God a praise. Give your and thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.